Good afternoon. I'm Chris Humphrey, the Executive Director at the EU ASEAN Business Council. I'm very pleased to invite you here to our, our final uh, webinar of 2021 and the final one in our ASEAN 2021 Digital Toolkit series uh, sponsored by SAP. Today we are talking about cross-border payments in the region. I think we all know that digital payments have become a key enabler for digital commerce and cross-border transactions in particular, they're instrumental in the development of ASEAN's economy going forward. And uh, one thing the uh, current pandemic has taught us is it's, a change, it's been a game changer. It's helped accelerate the adoption of digital payments in a region where cash previously reigned supreme. I think movement restriction orders have forced businesses to shift operations online and consumers in turn have turned to e-commerce for everything from food to daily essentials and indeed to luxury goods. Uh, then on top of that, the region's large base of underbanked customers is now also more empowered to make online purchases as e-payment platforms have begun to proliferate in the region. Beyond e-commerce, of course, the adoption of digital payments is predicted to increase consumption in other financial services, such as digital remittances, lending, investment and insurance. ASEAN's digital payments are in fact expected to triple to about 1.5 trillion US dollars by 2030, and the demand for cross-border instant payments is also expected to grow. However, there is still some way to go in a region in terms of integration and seamless cross-border transactions. E-payment innovation remains largely a domestic endeavor, and there is still a lack of a regional ecosystem that supports interoperability and the harmonization of standards, a robust regulatory framework, and the development of secure digital infrastructure. With our panel here today, I am hoping that we can get more into discussion about how governments can build trust in digital payments, particularly across borders, how stakeholders can work together to strengthen digital IDs and facilitate the adoption of cross-border digital payments, and how a new digital banking services can promote financial inclusivity right across the region, and also what remaining roadblocks there are that need to be removed to help with cross-border payments. We are very pleased to have with us today Dr. Akis Bhutabharat, who is the Director for Payment System Policy at Bank Indonesia. We have Nick Illingworth, who is a Strategic Architect in Financial Services at SAP Fioneer. Ben Dyson, who is an advisor and BIS Innovation Hub here in Singapore. And last but not least, Rishikesh Tinaika, who is the Business Innovation Lead for Asia Pacific for SWIFT. SWIFT, of course, is the uh, thing that's been underpinning most of our banking transactions over the last few decades. Um, welcome, gentlemen, all of you. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Uh, very good to see you all, and I hope you're all keeping very well. Um, I'd like to open up, actually, with a, with a very general question, uh, and I'll, I'll perhaps uh, turn to Pat Hattis first with it, as a representative of a central bank here in the region. But perhaps you can all just give me two or three minutes your thoughts about where cross-border payments currently stand in the region, uh, the current landscape vis-a-vis -vis perhaps other places in the world, and what your immediate hopes are. So, Pat, if you don't mind. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I think uh, there is a, a general perception that the cross-border payment are still facing um, several friction, uh, um, more than the domestic uh, payment. Uh, which is the high high cost, low um, speed, limited access, and insufficient transparency. Um, but my understanding in the uh, uh, Asian region, um, the challenges is more on the high cost, how to to minimize, to reduce the cost, and and to improve the, the transparency. So. Um, there are uh, plenty of uh, opportunity to, to improve these uh, cross-border uh, payment, um, not only from uh, not only by by improving or enhancing the existing uh, payment system, but also uh, by exploring and implementing the new uh, payment system uh, infrastructure and arrangement. And 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 we we learn that. Um, Going forward, we we expect that uh, the implementation of the cross-border payment roadmap will um, will uh, will be fruitful uh, in the coming years, so that we can expect the the cross-border uh, uh, payment will 
uh, will be will be uh, able to manage the the, uh, the the friction that is currently exists. Um, uh, I stop here. Thank you. Richard Cash, perhaps I'll, I'll come to you next, if you don't mind. Um, given that SWIFT already runs a network which allows for cross-border payments, perhaps you can give us your viewpoint on, on where things presently stand. Yeah, I think thanks, thanks, Chris, for inviting me firstly. Uh, and when we talk about uh, cross-border payments in ASEAN region, I think one of the key things is the uh, way the domestic payments have uh, really expanded, right? Uh, and you spoke about some of the numbers, uh, the real-time infrastructure that is coming in and everything. So with that, there is a customer expectation that comes in around that whole instant frictionless seamless experience that we need from across border as well i i agree with uh, sir earlier that uh, that reduction in that cost element and uh, making sure that the services etc are there uh, towards creating that seamless experience i think that's where the major uh, thrust is not to uh, forget the whole ISO 2022 and richer standards, uh, et cetera, that are also coming in, which which essentially uh, aid in this endeavor, right? So that's where we see, uh, uh, and, and we, we have that experience in uh, uh, working through few of our solutions that that's where the entire community is looking towards. It's reduction in friction and how to go, or rather how to bring that domestic customer experience into a cross-border context. Thank you. Uh, and Nick, your, your viewpoint, you've got lots of experience in this area. Indeed, and, and, and uh, uh, mirroring what uh, Richard has just said, I'd like to thank you, thank you for inviting me to, to, uh, to participate in this forum, have they have the opportunity to express an opinion here? Um, I mean, I think picking up on the point which um, Dr. Akis made, made first off, of course, that it's it's not a secret that there are huge problems in the area of uh, cross-border payments. Um, the four challenges, the FSP four challenges, which are well known, which are of course costs are very high, and that's 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 one of the biggest ones. Um, Trans uh, speed, of course, is, all, is, is always a problem across border, especially where you have long chains of correspondent banks. Um, and ac accessibility, of course, is also can be an issue for, uh, for poor, particularly for poorer, lower income people uh, who, who need access to cross border payments. Um, because there they can be dependent on cash out processes, they can be dependent on ATMs, and the ATMs have to have have, have um, cash in them and so on. So there are a lot of there are a lot of problems there to be um, to be addressed. Um, but I think a key one, of course, is transparency. It's not just um, transparency because transparency speaks to confidence. Um, so if you're trying to build up the the profile of um, of, of cross border payments in in the ASEAN region, uh, the citizens in the region need to have confidence in in the um, in the systems and so on. And this is something where I think both private sector and public sector have a big role to play. Private, of course, the private sector has got to drive this and is doing a hell, hell of a lot to um, have, have new, new business models and so on, new, new payment models. But of course, one of the key features, I think, and the question was about um, ASEAN and the, the Asia Pacific region in, uh, uh, specifically, one of, the key, one of the key features that I do see in um, Asia Pacific, um, perhaps more than in some other regions, is the degree to which the, the governments here are, are, are cooperating effectively. So you see a lot of, uh, a lot of initiatives, um, both with digital payments, so, you know, um, cryptocurrency experiments and so on, as we've seen in Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, Malaysia and so on, that the, the cross-border experiments that, that have gone on there, um, but also in terms of conventional payments and the recent uh, Project Nexus experiment, which, which connected up, successfully connected up uh, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, but also the Eurozone, uh, which of course is a very nice example for us as the EU ASEAN uh, meeting. So, so I think there are a lot of challenges, but I think the governments are very much on the ball. 
Thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks for giving me a nice segue to bring Ben into the conversation, mentioning thanks. Nexus there. Um, so, so Ben, you're you're the project lead on, on Project Nexus. Perhaps you can give us your viewpoint on where cross-border payments are and, and indeed why we need why we need Nexus. Certainly. Um, yeah, I think it's it's instructive how uh, how easy it is to make a payment in some countries in the ASEAN region. Like even uh, I've been in Singapore for the last year and it's so much easier to send money to somebody else here than it is back in the UK. Um, and the UK was actually one of the first countries to, to implement a fast payment system. But the technology here is, is leapfrogging um, what we have in, in Europe. Um, what I find really interesting about this region is the, um, uh, the efforts to link domestic fast payment systems across borders. So uh, Singapore and Thailand have been connected since April last year. Um, so the, the connection between the prompt pay service in Thailand and pay now in Singapore. Um, and there are similar initiatives between Singapore and Malaysia, uh, Singapore and India, Malaysia and Thailand. Um, I could go on. There's, there's a growing number of uh, bilateral links between these uh, countries. And I think each of those links can enable you to process cross-border payments within, um, within minutes, if not seconds. Um, and, and that's a real significant benefit over some of the more traditional cross-border payment options that have been available until now. Um, so I, I think it's a, there's a lot of innovation in the, in the region um, and a lot of potential to improve on cross-border payments over the next few years. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Richard Kish, I'll, I'll come back to you, um, if you don't mind. Uh, and please, people in the audience who have questions, do use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Rich Kish, I'm coming to you because we're talking about here new innovations uh, for cross-border payments, linking domestic instant payment systems with a neighbouring country's one as well. But at SWIFT, you have you have GPI, the, the Global Payment Initiative, already, which does allow for instant payments for those countries or those banks that are on the network. So do we need these new fangled ideas as well? Or is there a role still for, for GPI to play in this? Um, and uh, you, you have problems, I think, with GPI as well. You can... I don't think every country in Southeast Asia is on the GPI network at the moment. So perhaps you can just give us your viewpoint. Uh, sure. So uh, I think when we are talking about uh, the cross-border payments and some of the uh, problems that were raised, I think uh, all these factors that we speak about in terms of compliance, in terms of currency controls, in terms of all the friction points that get created in a cross-border payment, that's what leads to these significant delays and, uh, you know, the repairs uh, aspect of the whole uh, payments and just the uncertainty of the uh, receipt of the fund. So as you rightly said, I think uh, GPI is uh, meant to solve for all of that. I think we, we uh, introduced GPI way back in 2017 and it was essentially created to address these frictions. Uh, how do we uh, uh, speed up the transactions? How do we uh, take care of the frictions that are affecting the customer experience and we have a finality of your, or in, in other words, a transparency around the payments processing. So from a GPI perspective, we are, uh, you know, about 80 odd percent of our cross-border traffic is already live on GPI now. And in the, uh, in the next coming year, probably it might uh, even touch close to 90% because a lot of the uh, other banks have joined in as well. I think uh, in ASEAN as well, it's the similar picture. I wouldn't say, uh, you know, it's not all countries. I think most of the countries have uh, come on board on GPI. Uh, we have about uh, similar numbers in the ASEAN region as well. And I think from just the performance perspective, putting some numbers, we when we talk about instant, we talk about frictionless, about 44, 45% of those transactions that are live are actually getting credited within minutes, right? So that whole cross-border uh, or rather the experience of fast payments in a cross-border space is, is possible through GPI even today, right? So there are positive outcomes out of the whole uh, experience. Uh, but not only that, uh, we are building on top of that GPI uh, as numerous value-added services to 
to essentially solve for these problems even further. So when we talk about instant, we talk about frictionless. I think that's what we are doing. So if you look at it from the entire payments chain, uh, there's a clear pre-processing step where the objective is to minimize as many errors. So uh, that aids in efficient payments, that aids in production and cost of a payment because right up front you are figuring out what the problem could be. In the execution step, we are building on and on on our uh, GPI proposition. So there is not only for a high value, but we have uh, recently announced our service for a low value uh, or, or the retail aspect uh, of, of the payments where we have a solution that even takes that GPI experience uh, further. And then in the whole post-processing phase, we have uh, numerous tools that essentially aid in your, your compliance, that aid in this uh, uh, case management, uh, investigations, uh, et cetera, right? And then to top that with the whole ISO 20022, which will give you the whole uh, rich data and what we are going to do with the whole uh, platform uh, implementation, which will take it from just a pure messaging to a complete transaction, right? So all these services that are today existing and banks are implementing those separately, like your pre-validation, your uh, 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 data analytics, your uh, compliance related, financial crime compliance related the services will all get mutualized into that platform and you'll have all these uh, new technologies in terms of API, cloud, etc. that you can, you know, uh, uh, as access those as well. So what Swift is doing in that sense from a cross-border perspective is, is basically building the rails on which provide all these services and which banks can essentially use and enhance their customer experience. Now, when we also talk about the, you know, the market infrastructure linkages, et cetera, I think from our SWIFT perspective, this is something that we have been doing, right? Uh, and when you, when you now, uh, put across all that I said about what is already in place in terms of complete friction reduction, in terms of moving on to that platform. Uh, those are some of the services that are very, very similar to what probably uh, these interconnection of MIs would probably be doing. And, uh, you know, there are issues that need to be tackled in terms of that interlinkages, mainly around compliance and uh, from a SWIFT perspective, we don't see what we are doing in terms of, let's say, GPI instant or all the GPI to be very different from what, uh, you know, let's say a Nexus will do, right? So uh, we look at it from a very complementary perspective that, uh, you know, uh, we all can contribute towards that uh, vision, as I said earlier, of uh, instant and frictionless, right? So that's how we look at it. Thank you. I like the description of you're, you're the rails that the trains are all going to ride on between the countries. Uh, I guess that's our, our turn to you. Bank Indonesia recently, of course, announced a cross-border QR code payment system with, with, with Thailand. Perhaps you could just explain more, Chris, about the rationale for that. I mean, why Thailand? Um, and why do you see the need for it? And do you see uh, yourselves expanding to other neighboring countries in ASEAN as well? Or perhaps why can't we just tackle this in one big go in the region? Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, let me start from what Nick mentioned before that uh, as he, he elaborates the uh, examples of the uh, or cases of the four of the friction. Um, one, of, one of that is uh, uh, the reliance on the correspond correspondent banking system, right? And the, the interlinking cross border payment um, is. Um, is I think is quite high impactful to, to address this, that friction. So the, uh, so um, Asian member uh, countries, Asian member states um, uh, have started to develop the uh, bilateral interlinking cross-border uh, payment, uh, such as the QR cross-border payment. So um, um, the interlinking cross-border payment uh, such as the QR uh, cross-border payment actually run under um, well cross-currency arrangement or multi-currency arrangement instead of using 
using a, a common currency denomination. And it's uh, in each jurisdiction, uh, payment infrastructure are directly interlink each other uh, through through uh, a shared a technical interface. So there is no uh, centralized network, no centralized infrastructure. Um, that's that's uh, I think one of the concern that we we better start from the bilateral uh, interlinking first. Yeah. Um, but going forward, um, there is a possibility to have a multilateral platform of cross-border payment among AMS. So um, the Asian uh, Working Committee on Payment and Settlement System uh, has a vision for, for, for the, uh, the kind of multilateral platform, but uh, we encourage to, to for, for, for a, a bilateral cooperation first. And it's, I think it's based on the, the, the uh, mutual interest uh, between those countries. So uh, currently we, we are under um, uh, experimentation, uh, piloting with Thailand. And um, going forward, we will start with, with other countries in, in the region, uh, such as Malaysia and, and um, yeah, uh, yeah, and also with Singapore. So we are, we are um, uh, also considering to, we already talked with, with Singapore for, for that cooperation. So um, um, we, we learned that the SB or CPMI cross-border payment roadmap in the building blocks 17, um, uh, uh, the, the CPMI has uh, mandated to consider uh, the feasibility of a new multilateral platform and arrangement uh, for, for cross-border payment. And the working group for the building blocks has classified uh, uh, four models of multilateral platform, depending on the type of network uh, arrangement, whether centralized or, or not, and a type of currency arrangement, whether a common currency denomination or a multi-currency or cross-country arrangement. So there is there is a, a possible model of multilateral platform that, that doesn't need to have a centralized network uh, or infrastructure and, and for, for a cross-currency cross or multi-currency settlement. Um, I learned that it's called the hub and spoke model. So with, with that kind of model, I think it the model may suit the need uh, of the Asian countries for a multilateral platform and interlinking in the future without um, you know uh, um, kind of giving up the the uh, the sovereignty of the payment infrastructure uh, 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 to the centralized network. Um, but without needing to have a common uh, a currency a denomination. So there's still uh, room for that. So um, yeah, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's my uh, answer to your question. I think we can elaborate later. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Nick, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, we heard Ben earlier mentioning, of course, that you know, here in Singapore, where I am as well, where there's a proliferation of instant payment systems we, we can yes. choose from. Um, and we heard uh, Pakakis there talking about some of the challenges in ASEAN, but the, the ideal is to move to an ASEAN-wide solution. Can you just give us your thoughts about, you know, why has there been so much easier progress at, at national levels? Um, and what are the problems with doing things on an inter-regional basis at the moment? Oh, well, uh, at a national level, of course, um, you have much less friction in terms of uh, standards, in terms of the way people use messages, the messaging standards themselves. Um, you have, of course, you don't have uh, uh, currency conversion issues. Um, and the, 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 the focus of the central banks in promoting, um, in promoting prosperity and, and uh, ease of uh, access to payments and so on is, is always at a national level first of all, and we've, we've seen this, um, for, for instance, in the, in the area of development of uh, cryptocurrencies and so on, um, 
the whole the whole movement has been building up over about the last five years or so. But it started it started with very much with isolated instances. Canada, for instance, with their Project Jasper, or 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 indeed Singapore with Project Ubin and so on, um, looking at the possibilities of, of using of using these kinds of, of new models. Okay, it happens to be crypt cryptocurrency models, but it, it could be other types of models as well. Um, so that's all. It, 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 it always has to start with uh, with I think uh, a national focus. But if you look at how at, again at how the um, how, how the initiatives in that area have developed. It started small, if you like. It started focused with um, with, with national uh, initiatives, but then we've seen uh, for, after about two or three years, we saw the, the build up of cross border cooperations. Firstly, between, for instance, um, Central Bank, uh, um, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and Bank of Thailand, um, Singapore, and Malaysia, and so on. Um, and so, th for the last two or three years, we've we've seen a lot of um, development uh, uh, cooperation within regions. I think, and, and you see that in other regions as well. So, for instance, if you look in, um, well, Europe, of course, where, where where we know a hell of a lot was was done to, to set up actually the eurozone, but but in other regions as well. If you look in the Middle East, for instance, um, cooperation, cross border cooperation, started very much between the UAE and and the Saudis to set up, and where they've now set up a, a centralized. Um, uh, RTGS system, which handles cross-border currencies as well, in so, in, in somewhat way, as, uh, same way as we've seen in ASEAN. Um, so basic, basically, the the problems that to, to to come back to your question, I think the problems that you see at a national level are much more under the control of the central bank. So you can impose standards locally. You can have local um, standards. IDs, for instance, I think we're going to come on later to talk about IDs. But of course, identity systems are very very heavily um, based locally, so we you solve the the low hanging fruit first, and then you move on to the the cross cross border pieces. Um, but I do think it, it's uh, it, it's a much harder series of questions to answer. But I think if you look at the what's been done um, in GPI, if you look at what's been done with the GCC um, real time growth settlement system and and other initiatives, you can see that you do. Um, it is possible to, to pick up on the point that um, Dr. Ahif was, make, was making. It's not necessary to have a single currency um, to solve all the problems. You can still have different currencies in the different um, areas. And if you have harmonization, you have harmonization, for instance, um, Rishi Keshe was, was mentioning uh, messaging standards. If you have more, more standard use, uh, more, uh, clearer rules, clarifications of the rules for use of, of things by ISO 222 uh, messages, for instance, um, then incrementally you can you can make progress. And I think, given given the scale of the frictions, I mean, um, you, you see you see in, in my job where I where I'm doing implementation in core banking and uh, payment systems, you see the extent to which people historically have customized systems, made the, uh, the legacy systems they've overloaded. Uh, Fields in the messages that they have, and so on. Um, it's easy to wish that away, but it's it, but the devil is in the detail, and it's very, very, very encouraging from the point of view of someone like myself to see just how much progress has been made in areas like GPI and so on. For instance, um, I think going forward, we will want more cooperation. For instance, in the areas of IDs, having having the ability to use um, IDs across across border, because of course. Um, We've, we haven't talked yet really about problems around AML and countering uh, terrorist funding and so on, but it's very it's a very serious issue that you need to really be sure um, the the identity of the people across the borders, and that's and that's much harder to do cross border than it is um, uh, within a border. So to summarise, there are a lot of problems there. Um, and the devil is in the detail, but but I think the most encouraging feature is the level of public cooperation between the different central banks and regulatory authorities and NGOs, and, and, and then involving the um, the private organisations and corporations, to some extent SWIFT, but also those software vendors like ourselves, uh, and also the big consultancies, extensions and so on, who also, who also have a big part to play here. 
Thank you, Nick. I'm sure the big consultants are rubbing their hands with glee. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they will. <laughs> the dollar signs will be coming up in their eyes. Uh, ben, you're working on a project which is aiming at trying to solve some of these issues. This is also a space where there's a proliferation of, of, of fintech firms coming out. They're all promising to, to help with instant payment solutions, help people get from being unbanked or uninsured to banked and insured at the same time. Um, how that project Nexus, are you navigating some of those issues with the, the multiple players in the market space, some established, some pretty new into it, as well as dealing with some of the concerns that people like Paka Kits would have in central banks at the same time. So your ideas for overcoming some of the problems also that Nick was just talking about. So Nexus is, um, uh, the idea of Nexus really is to support these uh, connections between instant payment systems or fast payment systems. So um, like the work that has been done between Singapore and Thailand, for example, to connect those uh, two payment systems, when you do that bilaterally, uh, it means you can you can do this quite quickly. You know, you you only have two parties that need to agree, and you can get the work done, and you can build that connection, and and it has benefits for you know the people who actually use it to send cross border payments. Um, when you try to scale that up to multiple countries, it becomes increasingly complex. So by the time uh, you know, if you have a, a network of twenty countries, there are actually uh, 60 fast payment systems live in the world today and more are being developed. If you were to try and connect all of those through bilateral links, you would need 1,770 bilateral connections. Um, so that, you know, as, as a model, it reaches its limits. It's very good when you have close trading partners um, or countries where you have a, a kind of a strong remittance relationship. Um, but it's very difficult to scale it up to multiple countries. And what Nexus does is um, try to support that work by standardizing the way that these different systems connect. Um, so it, it uh, does things like coordinating with um, FX providers uh, who will be banks in the, in the countries that the payments are going between uh, to ensure that you have FX, FX conversion. Uh, it supports uh, some of the necessary processes like uh, message translation, sanction screening, uh, confirmation of payee, uh, where that's available in the country. And um, but what Nexus also does is it accommodates those differences between the different systems. So it's going to take um, it's going to take time before everybody settles on a standard. So uh, ISO 20022 is great. It would make a, a huge difference to how easy it is to connect these systems together. But, you know, some countries have their legacy infrastructure. It takes time to switch that over to new standards. Um, so Nexus will uh, set out kind of the ideal arrangement, but it also accommodates the differences and the limitations of what we have today. Um, and, you know, it should be clear, uh, Nexus is still a proof of concept, so uh, we don't know if it work, will work in reality yet. Um, that's what we'll be exploring over the next year. Um, but if it does work, it should make it a lot easier to connect instant payment systems and give you instant cross-border payments. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I think Nick earlier mentioned that the issue of digital IDs as well. Um, I wish you could, I'll come to you first on, on this particular topic. I mean, because for a digital ID is absolutely crucial for, for digital payments to work uh, and indeed across border payments. But we live in a world where many regulators worry about uh, personal data issues and, and cross border data flows. Um, how can stakeholders work together to help strengthen the idea of digital IDs, make sure everything is safe and secure uh, and then therefore help facilitate the adoption of more digital payments? Yeah, so. <clears throat> The uh, core of a digital ID is, is uh, you know, it's the utility of, like you said, in the information across uh, using them in different services within geographies uh, where different rules might apply. It's essentially to streamline your KYC. It would be, you know, huge plus in the cyber risk compliance obligations. Uh, I have two points to make there. I mean, first one is... Uh, I, I come back to the ISO conversation around uh, standards and richer standards, et cetera. 
I think one of the key benefits out of that whole standards will be in passing on this information in a much, much uh, granular, safe, secure way where uh, A, it leads to standardization, but it leads to more effective compliance checks, more effective screening, more effective use of uh, the digital ID towards that, uh, uh, you know, in the cross-border space. And the second bit is, uh, you know, for example, uh, with SWIFT, we, you know, take an example of uh, uh, KYC, right? Uh, we, we created a KYC registry for banks, uh, and then eventually we have uh, rolled it out to the corporates as well. But that's what uh, it serves. So it's a, it's a secure data source uh, for that information to be available. Uh, such that uh, participants can avail that information and more effectively do the KYC check, for example, right? So it's it reduces that whole back and forth of information uh, time and time again. I think a similar approach uh, has to be taken uh, with the whole digital ID uh, bit as well, where uh, that that common source that can be reutilized uh, within different geographies uh, and and reutilize the standardization uh, towards towards access of that information. I think we have clearly seen, especially with our financial crime compliance portfolio as well, that such uh, databases, such uh, services that reutilize that concept, I think are, have been very, very successful. So. Uh, nothing stops it uh, to be extended into the digital ID space as well. That would be that would be my thoughts on that. Thank you. Anybody else have any views before I move on? No. Ben, yes. I, I think um, uh, digital ID is another area where you don't have these standards um, and you have the similar kind of complexity that you have with cross-border payments. Um, and when we started the Nexus project, we had considered how to plug digital identity into um, cross-border retail payments, so person-to-person, -person, and um, discovered quite quickly, it actually, uh, with the exception of maybe Singapore and uh, probably Estonia, uh, most countries are just not there yet um, in terms of uh, having those digital identity systems and then allowing other systems to connect to them to verify uh, somebody's identity. Um, and it, it means there's a lot of work there, but there's also a lot of potential uh, to significantly improve cross-border payments if you can open up some of those digital identity systems and allow them to be connected to payment systems. Thank you, Ben. Uh Pakaki, so I'll come to you. Um, of course, central banks play a key role in all of this. Um, what do you see as, as your key function as a central bank going forward? Is it to act as the, as the policeman, the regulator only, or more of a facilitator? Um, well, the role of central bank in the, um, in the future, of course, the payment. Um, I think it should be more more active and yeah, only play as a, as a regulator, a supervisor, or procedure. Um, but also um, actively uh, engage as a, as an operator. Um, yeah, currently central bank has managed uh, the um, uh, national clearing system and real time growth settlement, but uh, they also a trend um, internationally to uh, uh, to also um, directly involved in the retail uh, fast retail payment system, and um, I think it it it's uh, justifiable because the uh, the friction is still is still uh, large. Uh, um, for instance, in terms of the the cost and. Um, um, in order to uh, 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 to have a, a significant contribution to enhance the cross-border payment, uh, the central banks uh, should um, enhance their domestic payment first. Um, so in this regard, we feel that central banks should 
develop a healthy, a competitive and innovative domestic payment system industry. And um, uh, complemented by the, you know, uh, implementing a payment system infrastructure, um, interconnection and interoperability uh, domestically, um, but also um, in developing the, the interoperability, um, the central banks should also, um, you know, design, uh, the, the, make a design that, that uh, enable the infrastructure to 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 connect uh, across border, and another another thing, the central bank should should promote the healthy, uh, efficient, proper market practices in the business of payment system. Um, by doing that, I think uh, central bank central bank. Um, uh, by playing this role, uh, this role, and and pursuing the uh, the domestic payment uh, objective, uh, they will also lay foundation for enhancing a cross border payment. Um, so, um, well, the future of um, cross border payment system will will very much shaped by the implementation of the cross border payment roadmap. Uh, by the FSP and the CPMI uh, uh, working groups, and um, in that uh, roadmap, the the role of central bank is is crucial. Uh, the directive in, uh, uh, involved in the um, in the committee and also the the in FSB. So uh, the role um, can start from you know stock taking on public outreach or consultation with, with industry, but also uh, actively identifying existing standards and practices and, and identifying a gap, a gaps for, uh, uh, for improvement, for alignment. And then um, central banks within the group uh, develop frameworks, standards, and, and, and uh, implementation and also implement the framework and standard, and finally monitor and evaluate the implementation achievement of the, of the targets. So, Thank you. Um, central bank, um, yeah. So that's that's uh, um, my take. Back to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, whilst I got you, there's, there's a question come up in the Q and A, which I think is a very good question. And I'd like, I would like all four of you to have a go a stab at answering it. But I'll start with uh, with Takahis, please. The question is, you know, what about non-bank players that are now dominating the, the field in this area? Um, they're leading the charge in cross-border payments. So where do the banks stand in the future? How can they remain relevant? Yeah. Uh... Well, the, the cross-border payment um, improvement is, is for uh, all the payment system provider, not only banks, but also non-banks. Yeah. So um, uh, the, um, you know, the reliance on the cross-border banking uh, models, um, uh, I think will be, um, will be uh, eased by the, um, uh, uh, initiative like, such as the interlinking. Uh, so the role of central bank in, in, in um, providing the, the uh, uh, more efficient uh, gross border payment, uh, I think will be, will be important uh, going forward. And um, that's, I think, um, the role of, of the central bank in, in, in uh, promoting and also being active in the, in the interlinking, uh, we hope that it will uh, promote the innovation, promote the competition further among the existing uh, 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 payment system uh, provider, uh, both uh, bank or non-bank. So, so um, yeah, so um, market imperfection or even um, market failure, potential market failure will be addressed and, and um, by the by the involvement of the central bank uh, through the initiative. Yeah. Rishikesh, do you want to have a stab at the answer to this question as well? Yeah, yeah, sure. 
so if you if you look at it right i think uh, when, when you talk about the user experience uh, the customer experience there are for banks to you know to to that question of competing in this space it's it's all about providing that seamless experience so when let's talk about retail the expectations are a bit different right you cost is a huge element uh, you need certainty you need the instant nature of that payment to go in uh, upfront transparency and you you don't want you know the speed is also of 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 a huge concern so from our perspective i think i briefly mentioned earlier but uh, this new service that we I spoke about swift go which is towards this low value payments it's it's essentially building on top of gpi and trying to even further enhance the capabilities in terms of uh, the sla stricter slas give that uh, uh, you know upfront transparency around fees time etc uh, such that banks can utilize uh, that that uh, uh, that that uh, uh, asset and and use it towards servicing these customers and you know create that uh, uh competition to the existing fintech players so from our perspective we are we are building all of that so that banks can reutilize uh, or other utilize some of those uh, investments utilize that service and then be a fair competition to you know what is happening with the fintech space so that's that would be thanks rishikesh uh, nick can i give yes, you your, your yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I've got a couple of takes on this. I, I think um, I think firstly, um, the clear, if, if you're a bank, there clearly is a risk that uh, that new new entrants will come into the market, fintechs and so on, and will and will eat, eat your lunch for you. Um, clearly, that that does happen to some extent. Um, if, if you look at models like, of course, PayPal is an obvious example, but also uh, attempts by the social media companies to get into. Um, Digital, uh, digital cryptocurrency payments, and, and, and this kind of thing. So, so yes, the banks are um, are threatened with with loss of business, and that's a good thing. That puts them under that puts them under pressure uh, to innovate. To uh, as, as as has been said, you know, for instance, in the in the Swift era, to um, to optimize the 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 pure banking services so so that they work more efficient efficiently. We um, uh, we all applaud that, of course. Uh, um, I mean, I think in, what, in terms of what the banks can do, um, they need to focus on user experiences, as, as, as was mentioned. They need to focus on uh, seeing how they can uh, create uh, create new models. Can they, can they create new conventional models using the building blocks which are already there? You know, using payment cards and so on, or, or indeed using digital currencies, stable coins. Um, Private digital currencies, or indeed with cooperation with the central banks, of course, with uh, central bank digital currency, which would have a lot of lot of advantages. But as, uh, point I would just like, like also to make is, I think people um, people who look in or into the banking industry from the outside and who aren't, in, aren't involved with the day to day uh, problems of implementing um, banking software and, and banking processes. Uh, um, can tend to underestimate the, the barriers to entry and the uh, and the diff and the uh, and by by the same token think that the the position of the banks is less secure than it really is. If you look, if you look at um, new entrants into the uh, some of the banking markets, UK of course I know very well. It's been very hard for small uh, com new competitors to come in, fentex and so on, to come in and really um, really challenge the major banks because. Banking isn't actually that easy. It's very, it's very hard. It's complex. It takes a lot of investment to do this, and so on. And particularly in the area of cross-border payments, um, one of one of the things which the regulators in, uh, in 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 Europe are trying to do is to try and um, have more entrance to the to the, um, to the cross-border clearing market, and so on. That's clearly an objective of the Bank of England, for instance, to have not just the four. Um, Clearers that do the cross-border clearing, but to, but to have but to have others besides. Um, in spite of all the efforts that they've made to to encourage more uh, entrance into the market, there has actually only been one new entrant that has actually made it in there over the last uh, five to ten years. 
So I don't think the banks are going away anytime soon. Of course, one of the things they can do is cooperate with um, uh, with financial services software vendors like ourselves to uh, to develop new business models and so on. And this is this is something. Um, not entirely joking, and there, there is a lot of scope for for co innovation. And you have, and the, I think the interplay between public, uh, the central banks, in particular, and NGOs, um, we could have examples of all of those. Um, that is a very creative mix, and it's good that it's good that there should be pressure because then. It forces people to be more creative and it forces the pace of development. Thank you, Nick. Uh, and Ben, perhaps your, your take on this particular question that was in the Q&A box as well, please. Uh, particularly, I think some of the systems that you're, you have here in Singapore that you're trying to link with other ones in the nearby neighbours actually run by big banks, things like PayLar and PayNow. So is that how they're going to remain relevant or are we going to get new innovation coming in from new players like Nick was just mentioning? eating their lunch for them? I, th I think, um, I mean, this is a really key question, right? And I think you could imagine being one of those institutions and thinking, well, why, why do I want to do something that uh, undercuts my revenue from cross-border payments? Uh, for, exa for example, going from you know, payments where, it, where you can charge a customer $20 for putting one payment through to something where it might be a few cents or a dollar. Um, I, and, you know, that's going to create a, a tension for the bank in, in considering, you know, how do they want to switch, which of these networks do they want to connect to, what services do they want to offer to their, to their customers. And the, the longer term risk they need to consider is the fact that, you know, some of these fintechs are providing this service faster and cheaper already. Um, and so I, I think anybody who's looking at that longer term will be thinking about uh, what service do we need to be providing to the customer? Because ultimately, um, if they're not, then those customers will will go. Um, and you know, speaking personally, when I have sent money back to family in the UK for uh, for birthdays and Christmas, um, <laughs> I compared the rates from the bank that I use now and, and um, some of the fintech providers, and the, the I did not use the bank. Uh, it was significantly more expensive. So. Okay. All right. Um, uh, could, could, I, could I make a, an additional point here, which, yeah, which, 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 which we have, which we haven't mentioned so far, but which, um, to, to some extent, is, is the elephant in the room, I suppose, which is the the social ob obligation to um, to re to reduce friction and to enable um, cross border payments as a matter of um, moral and ethical obligation, not only on the public sector but on the private sector as well, because let's. Let's be clear about this. One in eight of the world's population is depending on remittances, right? So you've got 200, you've got 200 million um, people across, around the world making remittances back to family in, in, in other countries. There are 800 million. There's uh, one in four. Uh, the, the, for, for every one remitter, there are, there are four people who are making the pay, who are receiving those payments. So it isn't. It isn't. Um, we need some enlightened self-interest here. From the commercial organizations not only the banks but the software vendors and everyone else who's involved here as well um social uh, financial exclusion is is a gigantic problem and it is one which we should be interested in from all aspects and not only from a commercial point of view and i certainly think it's, as far as um i mean i sometimes get asked as as, as a member of fap pioneer um how do you you know how do you justify the the ethical dimension of what you're doing as a software vendor. I mean, that kind of thing is is a very easy answer to it because um, it's easy to see what the obligation should be and and to agree that, that it is actually an imperative. Sorry, I don't want to take over the whole session, but I think that was important to say. You just took the words out of my mouth, actually, for the, the final uh, question I was going to come to all four of you on, actually, was a bit of a dual question. I mean, here in Southeast Asia, large parts of the region, cash remains, remains king. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit of an old dinosaur. I'd rather have some cash in my wallet than just using my, my apps on my phone to pay for things. Um, but how can we perhaps engender greater confidence in digital payments and particularly cross-border payments uh, to help people who are unbanked uh, be banked in the future and have access to finance and receive their payments and, and encourage more 
people to get on board with digital payments in the future? How, how can we create that confidence for them? Who would love to go first? I'm gonna, Nick, I'm gonna come to you because you raised yes, the point. Yes, sure. I, 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 I have a quick take on that. I mean, I, th I think a lot of this is about confidence, isn't it? Um, people, people trust cash. I mean, I, I, I saw a figure somewhere that um, 50% of the unbanked customers in, in the Latin American region, I mean, not ASEAN, but uh, in, in Latin America, 50% of, 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 of unbanked customers in the survey said that the reason they used cash and not bank accounts was because they didn't trust the banks. Um, so um, in, in, to, when, in speaking of cross-border payments and uh, enc encouraging um, inclusion, tr I think, tr and of course, usability is a big issue, but trust is a big issue. So all, all the all the elements that, that um, Dr. Akis mentioned first off, let's say um, cost, speed, transparency, um, and, well, cost, speed and transparency, inclusion, of course, is quite, accessibility is a slightly different thing. Um, those all, all go to the heart of, build, of building trust, don't they? If you feel you're being ripped off, if the thing is taking forever and you can't see what's happening and you don't know what you're being charged or why, none of that builds, you, builds confidence. Um, so it's a very good thing that there are targets, uh, you know, the 2030, the G20, G, um, 2030 targets of, of, of reducing costs, it, it, um, re increasing speed of payments to no more than, well, to, to drastically le less, less than the three to five days that it takes at the moment. But, but, but um, transparency as well, making, giving people the confidence that they can see what's happening. Um, all of that needs to be done. And, it, and, um, and of course, the central banks here, by regulating and forcing, uh, forcing the, the, the private sector to do this, uh, to, to implement these measures, I think that would go a long way towards um, increasing the, the confidence that people have and therefore the financial inclusion that results from making digital payments. Uh, so that's it from me. Let's hear from someone else. Thanks, Nick. Uh, ben, um, perhaps I'll come to you on it now. How are you, when you're developing Nexus, how are you aiming to build confidence in the system? I think, um, uh, so Nick touched on some of this, uh, but giving the, the transparency and the certainty. So uh, knowing what you will pay for this payment and what the other person will actually receive, um, rather than sending a certain amount and finding at the end that there's been numerous deductions and fees taken off along the way. Um, also having certainty about how long that payment will take and whether it's been successful or not versus you know the the olden days where you'd send a payment and uh, maybe it would arrive in a few days or maybe you'd have to call your bank to find out what was happening. Um, we want to move across uh, away from that um, and you know there is a lot of work across the industry and things like GPI um, are really helping with that. I think as you get more of that, you get more transparency over fees, you'll have people feeling more confident um, to use, you know, use the financial system and to make those cross-border payments. Um, the other thing, so this is not part of Nexus, but the other thing that would make a massive difference for financial inclusion is digital identity. Um, and you only need to look at India um, and the ADAR system to see how successful that can be in, uh, in boosting the number of people that have bank accounts. Thank you. Uh, Rishikesh, your, your final words on, on this topic. Building confidence, people have already big confidence in the SWIFT network, so anything to worry about? Uh, no, I mean, uh, from uh, firstly, from uh, the, the financial inclusion perspective, right, I think uh, Nick and Ben are bang on on that one. I think the uh, why cash is king is because there's a finality to it. You are seeing it getting transferred in an instant and you are getting services for it. I think if that same experience gets uh, transferred into a digital setup where you make it so, so very easy uh, to make that payment uh, and transparent and you know at that speed that is expected. So I think uh, that that in itself will be uh, a boost enough. And I think uh, unfortunately with the whole COVID pandemic, I think that was not the right way to happen, but that has boosted a lot of uh, these digital payments. Uh, I mean, because of just the people being forced into it, 
right? I, there was no other choice. So, and I think from what we see and separately what I read as well is that that sort of behavior is going to continue. Uh, and, and, you know, projects like what we were talking about today will only help that. And from a SWIFT perspective, I think if you look at it from the projects that are happening, the new players that are coming in, or even, you know, newer type of uh, models that might be built, I think at the heart of it, we, we, uh, we sway and uh, the platform strategy that we have will get all of these value added services towards that vision, right? So uh, that's how we look at it from the ever evolving uh, payment space, uh, not only here, but just globally, right? Thank you. Uh, final word as we're coming to the end of the, our time now to uh, Dr. Akis, please. And how, how can you as a central bank help build confidence in, in digital payments and indeed more particularly for this webinar in cross-border payments um, as a way of helping the unbanked get banked and helping your, your MSMEs in Indonesia perhaps trade across borders far easier as well? Uh, well, the... The ultimate objective of the uh, uh, transformation, uh, digital transformation in uh, payment and finance is, is financial inclusion. It's how to, uh, to, to um, onboard the unbanked people right, to, to uh, advance financial services. So that, that's why uh, the, the central bank, uh, like Bank Indonesia, um, accelerate the, continue to accelerate the digital transformation. Um, we have seen the the impact, um, you know, partly driven uh, by the uh, pandemic, COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic has been the the game changer for for the digital transformation. So we we have uh, had a, a success story on that. Uh, although yes, the the cash still king, but uh, I think with with uh, more accelerated um, uh, digital transformation. We can uh, bring more people to, to digital payment, and it is it is a gate. It is digital payment is a gate to to uh, uh, to, to 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 get access for the financial uh, for advanced financial services. So um, uh, the confidence can also uh, uh, supported by the uh, data governance. So I think uh, that's that's one of the uh, concern uh, for the people um, on the that the government. So credibility of the uh, uh, the payment system provider and also the, the central bank as regulator is I think is crucial uh, to to help build that uh, confidence. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating discussion, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your time this afternoon. Clearly, the future is going to be uh, more digital, more digital currencies and a lot more and faster and hopefully cheaper and more transparent cross-border payments as well. Um, I wish you all to keep safe and well. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, Nick, and where, where you are. Enjoy your yeah. evening for those of us here in the region. And, and thank you again for all, all joining us. I'm actually going off to spend some cash because I don't want my other half knowing where I'm spending my money at the moment. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.